cramming out up here uh, preaching. Maybe we can just bust into singing and y'all can <laughs> fix the rest of it. I you've got to look up. I recognize a posy when I hear one. Good to see everybody here today. I'm going to ask you to join me, please. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. I say this with fear of repeating myself. It's always a privilege, y'all, to be able to stand before you <coughs> and open the Word of God up together. First Peter chapter 5, I'm going to pick up reading verse 1. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Let's pray together, if you will. Now, Father, we do consider it, we count it, a privilege to be able to open the pages of this book. We live in a country where we have the freedom to exercise our religious beliefs. We thank God for that. We live in a country, Lord, where we're just surrounded. In fact, saturated with blessing from your hand. Yes. We deserve none of it. Mm. Most of it, Lord, we have misused. Mm -hmm. But we thank you for what we have. You did this. And we thank you for it. Thank God, we're gathered here today with Bibles in our laps, Bibles in our hands. What a privilege, what a blessing. For everyone to be able to have a copy of the Word of God. Yes, now, Lord, I know we've not treated it like we ought. But you continue in your faithfulness. And here we are again today. And you've promised in your book that if we'll open our hearts and open our ears and open our minds, that you'd speak to us. In fact, you promised if we'd seek you with our whole heart, we would find you. That's what we're after this morning, God. Through your word, please speak to us now. And as the psalmist said, open our ears that we may hear wondrous things. God, thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I hate to say this, but if I don't, I'm afraid I'll be embarrassed in a few minutes. I got the frog thing going on in my throat. I reached across the keyboard a few minutes ago. That's the first thing I could get hold of. And it must be one of them sour patch kids or some such thing. So I know you ain't supposed to say drool in church. But I feel like I got like four lemons going on. So if I start uh, dispensing spittle, I apologize. Be glad you ain't one of these roses up there. I wish there was a knob I could turn. This thing's killing me. I think I'd run out of frog. Anyway, weren't you glad to hear that? <laughs> the uh, message I've entitled this morning, continuing from last week, Feed the Flock Part 2. I'd like to begin by reminding everyone here we're Bible believers. That means not only that we believe the Bible to be true, but we believe that the Bible is literally the Word of God. Amen. If you don't have that decision made, uh, 
uh, I am, and I'm not trying to be a wise guy, I am sorry for you. You need to study that thing, go ahead and get that decision made, then you can be done with it, enjoy the Bible for the rest of your life. <laughs> but the reason that we use this title, uh, description, designation, as Bible believers, is basically because of the many who do not uh, believe the Bible to be true, and because of the many who do not believe that the Bible literally is the Word of God. And so we want to make sure that the distinguishing is made. There are two different camps. We're in one, others are in another. But it's easy to get hold of. It's the same thinking that causes us to have on our church sign, uh, Outer Banks Baptist Church. And that's just not a handle with no meaning. Uh, the property is located uh, on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and we are a church, and we are a Baptist church. Now, that's just about as clear as anything I know of. But I mention that simply to say that we're living in a society that has gotten to me in a very bad habit for apologizing for everything that we once stood for with great gusto. We apologize for being American. We apologize for being Southerners. We apologize for the American flag. We apologize for our military. We apologize for the Ten Commandments. We apologize for our Christianity. We apologize that our uh, belief that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, and we add that to the list because we're always afraid, it appears, of offending someone by what we believe. Mm -hmm. I think that's just about as backward as anything I know. If you're ashamed of what you are, be something different. But don't expect me to apologize for the way I feel, nor you uh, or I uh, feel that way about you. Gosh. Uh, as far as I know, you can enter this morning public church assemblies uh, who, if they have a sign, it doesn't say church. Uh, if it is a church and it's Baptist, it won't say Baptist church. Uh, and if it's a church, there's absolutely nothing on the sign that may even indicate that it's a church. And I'm told the reason for this is so that no one could be offended. Well, there are those who had bad experiences in church, so we, whatever we do, we don't want to make anybody mad. Has anybody here ever had a bad experience at Kmart? <laughs> Food lion? I hate to tell a story like this, but it is the truth. I'm not even embellishing, and I love to embellish. <laughs> <laughs> back, back in, we were at Food Lion recently. And there were two extremely large folk shopping with the same cart. Now, you probably know where I'm headed with this. Uh, I go to Food Lion not to fall in the parade, but to buy stuff and go home. And when you got two large, extremely large folks in a cart in one aisle, I got to like do a U-turn and go back, go back to number four and come back and sneak up on number five, unless they've got there ahead of me. Anybody ever had an experience like it? Well, I'm offended that you said food life. <laughs> Get over it, <laughs> God. I'm looking for the church sign that says, this is a gathering of people who don't want to offend anybody. That's the church you want to go to, amen? No, I don't think it's not that. <laughs> and we're not trying to offend anybody, but we are a church. Amen. Amen. And we're a Baptist church. And we believe that the only way both to get to God and to heaven one day is Jesus Christ. Amen. We believe the Bible is completely true, and we believe the Bible is literally the Word of God. Now, I like labels even on my canned food. So when I go to the cupboard looking for peanut butter, I don't want to come out with Alpo or Drano. <laughs> I'm saying all this to help, hopefully, you understand where I'm coming from here. I don't have any shame whatsoever 
about a church sign that declares who we are and what we believe. And if anyone gets offended, they can get unoffended and come on in, check it out, and find out why we're so happy about our title that we've got. I don't want anybody pulling our parking lot thinking that we're a library. I don't want anybody pulling our parking lot thinking that it's a food lion or a detention center. Amen? I didn't say attention, I said detention. Some of y'all look like you've been there. I've heard of, struck a nerve. We're Bible believers, and I don't want to mislead anybody into thinking that we're not Bible believers. And we are not Bible believers because it's election year. Amen? Uh, we're not Bible believers because my wife told me that I had to be. Amen? It's all right to amen, by the way. We're not Bible believers because it's the current trend. We're Bible believers because, like the old song says, we've tried His promises and found that they're true. They work. The Word of God. I have no more evidence that the Word of God, uh, the Bible is the Word of God than anybody else. But this thing I do have going for me, as do you, I've tried it. And it works. And I'm ever so grateful for that. Somebody said, disciples have learned that the Bible is God's tool. A tool. And this tool, His Word, if you will, uh, is what he uses in the disciple's life, the backslider's life, the lost person's life, just like we would use a tool from our toolbox. And I got to thinking about that thing, I thought, I really like that, that, uh, that idea. A carpenter uses a tape measure, a square, a saw, and a hammer, various other things. But it's to cut and shape and fit and form and come up with a, with a product. A painter uses a brush, a roller, a bucket, a pan. Uh, some people use a spray gun, so on and so forth. But he too is forming something, fashioning something, doing something that once it's done, it'll look a whole lot better, hopefully, than before he started. A tool, a seamstress. I'm way out of my tree here. But the seamstress uses a tape measure, a needle, a sewing machine. They tell me they've got sewing machines now you push buttons and you can tell me what to do uh, what a joy that would be you know <laughs> fix my bridges <laughs> and then the secretary uh, the computer is a tool the printer i don't know what a secretary uses file cabinets pencils my wife used to have a callus uh, on one of the knuckles, I think it was on her middle finger, where the pencil used to ride all the time, when she was doing her accounting work in the days of pencils. That was back when Fred Flintstone roamed the earth. <laughs> but these are tools. The whole idea here, not meaning any disrespect, but God uses His Word just like we would use these tools. Somebody said, well, wait a minute, that don't fit. Is God building something, fashioning something, remaking something? The answer is absolutely yes. Amen. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, his Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what God is fashioning. That's what he's forming. That's what he's fabricating, if you will, in your life and in my life. And how's he do it? He uses the Word of God. Aren't you glad for the Bible? I'd hate to show up at the judgment one day and be dumb as a stump as to what God expected of me. Why didn't you do this? Well, I didn't know that. I don't have to worry about that. Amen. Only reason I'll have for not doing it is because I'm lazy and no count. But not knowing won't be the issue. Thank God for the Bible, y'all. It's how we know anything that's fit. Proverbs 17, 3. I like this one. The finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord 
trieth the hearts. And with all else told us there, what the refining pot does for the silver, which is bring, of course, the dross to the top, and what the furnace does for the gold, bringing the impurities to the top, well, that's what the Lord does for the heart of a man. And he does it with his word. He exposes and then cleanses us from our sin. That's why John could say, 1 John chapter 3, when he appears, we won't have to be ashamed at his appearing. Now, can you imagine, y'all, the idea of God the Son appearing in the sky, coming down to this earth, and feeling no shame whatsoever, knowing that we're pure and clean, not because of me, in spite of me, but because His grace as it's revealed and affected in us by His Word. What an amazing thing! God, the pure one, we stand before Him with no shame. Gosh. Well, is the Bible the only tool that God uses in our lives? No. It would appear to be the primary tool. I mention these things, you know them as good as I do, but God's gone on record as using a serpent, Genesis 3, a donkey, Numbers 22, the jawbone of a donkey, Judges 15, a barrel and a bottle of oil, 1 Kings 17, and rocks in Matthew 3. That's how anybody can be used by God. Amen? How about this one? He used a dove, Genesis 8, a raven, 1 Kings 17, two she-bears, 1 Kings 2, then he used a small fish, Matthew 17, and then he used a big fish in Jonah chapter 1. But even though God has used many other things as tools in folks' lives, it's the Word of God, the Bible, that God himself calls our shield. Psalm 91, our light, Psalm 119, our mercy, Jonah 1, our joy, Jeremiah 15, the fire that purifies us and the hammer that breaks us, Jeremiah 23. It's the way we're set free, John 8. It's the way we get faith, Romans 10. It's the mirror that shows us, James 1, and the milk that feeds us, 1 Peter chapter 2. That's why we as disciples must continue in this word. John 8, 31. And that's why that we as sheep are to desire the sincere milk of the word. 1 Peter 2, 2. And that's why the elder or the pastor must feed this word to the flock. Amen. <clears throat> And that's why we're seeing Peter, if you will, feeding the Word of God in our passage before us this morning to the local pastors. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, that's written between the lines, but still to the Bible student it's crystal clear. As Peter says to the pastor, verse 1, I exhort you. I exhort you. Now instantly... To the Bible student, you've probably heard the word uh, exhort before. If you've done any studying, you know, you've heard of teaching, a sermon, so on and so forth. But it represents the Greek word, I apologize, Brother George, parakaleo, compound word that really means to get down alongside someone and to speak to them, to talk beside, if you will. And what we're looking at is the posture of an encourager. An encourager. So the Bible student's ears perk up. His radar lights up, if you will, when he hears Peter say, Listen, I exhort you. Anybody here ever, in fact, I was going to say, you ever watch a marathon race? How about this? You ever run in a marathon race? Wouldn't that be a blessing, y'all? Be able to run 25 miles? I don't even want to drive 25 miles. Unless I'm on vacation. And that's pushing it. If I drive all the way across the country, something's got to be wrong with it. Just teasing. Just teasing. But I've seen these marathon races. Of course, you know, it's a great, great crowd of folks out there running. I'm thinking about half of them come with a toe chain. 
and they slip the hook of the tow chain and the bell buckle to do the behind, and they just kind of coast as he pulls them along. Anybody? I don't have any proof for that. But if I ran 25 miles, somebody had to be pulling me somewhere. But I noticed the, the streets are just lined with people watching this, and you look a little more closely, and it's not just people watching. You really study that thing, and you'll see some folks on bicycles running or you know cruising along beside, or they'll be jogging along. Stories tell me that they'll be waiting in a certain spot, and almost like a uh, a runner with the baton, you know, when he sees it's his time, all of a sudden they'll start running. But if you pay really close attention, they'll get right out there beside of one of these runners and they start talking to him. Now, if it was me, I'd be saying, man, you ain't bright. You could be sitting at home eating chili dogs right now. <laughs> but they tell me what they're doing is encouraging these runners, you can do this. You've got this thing licked. This is nothing. You're more than a match. And it's almost like you can see them dudes' knees kicking a little higher and their elbows jutting a little further backward. There's nothing like some encouragement. Anybody? I don't care if you're pouring concrete, reminding people of their birthday, whatever it is you're doing, nothing like being encouraged. To me, encourage is the opposite of criticize. Anybody here like being criticized? If you raise your hand, if I weren't in church, I'd say you lying through your teeth. I've never known anybody that likes being criticized. I've never known anybody that didn't like being encouraged. Who here has heard of a cheerleader? Anybody? Okay, Dave's heard of a cheerleader. You may be fortunate enough to be like me. I married one. <laughs> Cheerleaders, y'all, are what's happening. I talk about the way they look. I'm grateful that they look the way they do. The ones on TV these days ain't got enough clothes on. They've, they've shifted from cheerleader to you fill in the blank. <laughs> but you remember what the job of a cheerleader is? I mean, this ain't hard to figure out. You lead cheers. Wouldn't it be nice to have... What would you call them? Uh, criticizing leaders? <laughs> Bunch of pretty little girls standing out there with pom poms and these great big old megaphones. Yo, number 64, you're a klutz. Why don't you give it up? Why don't you go back to the chess club? <laughs> That's my part. You do your part. <laughs> Man, now, I granted, some cheerleaders may not have a clue, you know, what they're doing out there. Touchdown equals what? You know, safety? What? But they ain't nothing, you know, like you've been out there, you're down and out, and they're stomping you to pieces. And having all these pretty little girls that were shaking the pom-poms and hollering, you know, I don't even remember what's in my heart. That shows you how old I really am today. Rah, 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 sis, boom, bah. You're the best football player ever was. I made that up in case you didn't <laughs> But there they stand, y'all, encouraging. Peter uses a word that can only mean one thing. I'm going to get down where you are, and I'm going to talk to you about this thing. I'm going to do you a little bit of this thing. Encouraging. Encouraging. Three points, if you will. Number one. All from verse number one. Well, that's sort of verse number one. He says, who am also an elder? In other words, I'm an elder. I'm a pastor. If you will, I got the same job you got. This is not, uh, you can read between the lines, Peter say, this is not a do what I say thing. This is a do what I do thing. If I knew you can do it. Come on, uh, if you will, fellow pastor. You can make it. <laughs> You can run this thing. And then you stop and realize, y'all, you remember who Peter was, right? Remember everything else that Peter is, was, and whatever. He was the one, just before betrayal night, short time before, he took Satan's part against Christ. Against the plan of God, Calvary's cross, and the gospel. You remember? 
Lord, you can't be going now to Jerusalem to be crucified. He said, well, no big deal. It was a very big deal. Do you remember what that earned him out of Jesus' mouth? Anybody remember? Get thee behind me who? Peter? Satan. Satan? Good night. You don't want God calling you the devil. Amen? Good. That was Peter. He took Satan's part. He got rebuked for it. And he also was the one that on the very night, in the very place, before the very people, that he needed to stand up and be counted for Christ, he denied that he even knew Jesus. You remember that? I don't even know. What are you talking about? And began to curse and swear. That to me, this is just me. It may not be. These are the details, y'all, that make the thing, forgive me, taste the way it does. We have pictures of uh, the saints, you know, the apostles in particular on stained glass windows and they glow in the dark. And it's, it's a pretty picture. You know, whatever. Peter won't know different than you or me, especially me. Good night. And it's as if you can read between the lines here as Peter gets down on his old fours and says, Look, I want to do a little encouraging here, man. I exhort you, listen, if God can forgive me, He can forgive anybody. I just about think that's literal truth. What more could you do against Christ than tell Him, whatever you do, don't go die on the cross. And then when somebody sticks a mic up to you to interview you, I don't know Jesus. What, what more could you do, Peter says? If God can forgive me, forgive anybody. If God can use me, God can use anybody. If I can be God's pastor, then so can you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever shut up. Don't ever give in. Do not ever leave your post. I am an elder, and you can do this. I love it, y'all. Isn't God good? He's not simply sitting in his ivory palace somewhere, barking out dictates for people he don't even care about. No, he sends people like Peter along to write the book and to encourage us. The second thing is, I'm a witness. If you will, he tells the pastors, I do the same thing that you do. The exact same thing. He said, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I saw his life. I tell him his life. Saw him die. Tell him about him dying. This is exactly what the risen Christ, and I'm adding a few words here for our sake. Peter says that he told us just before he went up. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. You'll be witnesses to me. And all that glorified word means is you're going to tell what you've seen and what you heard. And that's how folks get saved. Peter says, I do the same thing you do. I'm a witness. That's exactly what the other apostles were doing. 1 John chapter 1, the first three verses. John kind of lengthifies that thing out. Said, it says, said, what I've seen, what I've heard, this is what I'm bringing to you. What I've tasted, what I've touched, what my hands have handled of the Word of God, this is what I'm writing about. Peter says, hey, I'm a witness. I do the same thing that you do. This is what he's called you to do as a witness. And it's just tell others what you've seen and what he's done for you. It always tickles me. I hesitate almost to mention this. Uh, anybody here get the uh, biblical recorder? I know it's in uh, the uh, State Baptist Journal. And in the back they always have ads for preachers. They don't call it ads for preachers, but that's what it is. And I love to look at the qualifications for who they're looking for. What they're after. It, words just wouldn't do it justice. You need to check it out sometime. An old boy told me one time some years ago, uh, he had uh, contacted a church that had put out such and such. A, they gave him a nine-page application. <laughs> Yo, I don't understand. I mean, I can't write nine pages. I get war slam out. They think this dude's too lazy. We can't hire him. You wouldn't believe the qualifications they're after. All a pastor is, to, in fact, the, the, 
the text is teaching it to us. But all pastor, all Christian, all anybody that's a witness is called to do is tell what you've seen and what you've heard. And not lie about it. I've been saved. I can tell somebody else how it happened to me. Now, I may not uh, persuade them of anything. They may not believe a word I say. But I know how I used to live, and I know how I live now. And I've been living for the Lord for many years, and I can tell you a great number of things He's done for me just this week. And they're not necessarily the big go-in-the-dark spiritual things. He helps me with my work. He helps me to know how to do something, how to cut something, how to build something, how to attack something. Many is the time. And this is the honest truth, y'all. I'm in a fog. I'm in a day. I don't know how to do what I'm supposed to be doing. And there comes a picture in my mind. You say, oh boy, he slipped. Y'all, I slipped a long time ago. I'll see a picture in my mind of how that thing is to be built. Just a picture. I don't hear voices. I don't have visions, but I'll have a picture of the completed item. You call it what you want to. I say it's the Lord, the master carpenter, showing me how to do what I need to do. But I'm sure you do some concrete or mail department or whatever the case it is. But that's what we've been called to do, y'all. Not become high and mighty and be able to fill out nine or ninety page applications. We tell what we know. And he does the saving. Aren't you glad for that? Peter says, look here, boy. I'm an elder, you can do this. I'm a witness, you can do this. But he also says, thirdly, now this is from down in verse 4, put it all together. With you, I'm going to be a partaker of the glory. We talked about that from back in chapter 4, uh, verse number 13. When he appears, it's one of my favorite words, that Greek word apocalypto means to take the lid off the pot and allow us to see what's in it. And I automatically think about my kitchen and my wife who's been cooking my supper and I walk in and pull the lid off of something and I'm thinking, this is what it's all about, y'all. Next to the Lord's coming back, it's this thing right here. I'm going to go on it with both feet. You skinny people don't know nothing about that. But it blesses my heart. Anyway, Peter says, I'm the same as you, if you will. I'm going to get the same reward that you're going to get. I'm looking for payday. And again, Peter's not this stained glass window saint with a halo around his head that glows in the dark. He's a man like me and like you. And we're looking for payday. Yeah. Now, I love this life. Thank God for it. He calls it the grace of life. And it's a joy. 1 Peter chapter 3. But this ain't diddly squat. We got something better coming. Anybody? Mm -hmm. They told the story about some old sister who wanted to be buried with her spoon. Anybody know that story? I can tell it wrong, but won't nobody know it here. <laughs> but she was always raised up that uh, when they cleared the supper table, that they'd tell everybody, keep your spoon. Now, you know what that means? Only people like me. You don't have to be fat, but you like to love to eat. They know what that means. You ain't done yet. I'm going to take your plate, your glass, and your this and your that, but keep your spoon because banana pudding's on the way. <laughs> or whatever the case is. She said, listen, when they bear me, So I, there's no way to even compare these present sufferings with the joy we're going to know. You say, well, you know, I'm not motivated by rewards. I don't care. I am, okay? <laughs> I want to go, and I want to get what he's going to be willing to give me in his grace. I'm an elder, just like you, he says. You can do it. I'm a witness. Just like you, you can do it. And I'm looking forward to my reward, just like you, and you can do this thing. But then from the content, i got to quit. Verse 5 lets us know one more.
crystal clear, written between the lines, exhortation from Peter to the pastor. Likewise. Don't you love little words like that? Yo, speaking of diddly squat, that's like my uh, education in high school. <laughs> I went to high school because I had to. In them days, they didn't have alternative high schools. I was given an alternative. <laughs> you go to school and bring home good grades or I'll kill you. He said, that ain't so. Yo, I, lived, I grew up in a day where you got whooped. My daddy said about day high. He heard me use some bad words one day. I've told you this before. I was a great big strapping rascal, thought I could whoop anything on three, two, four legs, whatever. He said, if I ever hear any words like that come out of your mouth again, I'm going to wash your mouth out of the cell. Now, you know what I did, don't you? Arnold Schwarzenegger. I said, no, sir, you never hear me say no more. <laughs> he never did. I didn't give it up. A few more years, I got saved. But no, sir, buddy, not around him. Man, oh, man. Likewise. Likewise. One little word that lets us know, wait a minute, you don't start off a thought with likewise. What, what are you saying? Listen, I'm tying all this mess together. And he says, likewise, you younger submit. Don't you love that word? Somebody said it's the favorite word of the 21st century in America. <laughs> Wrong. Submit's Greek word, hupotasso. Poor George. Compound word, arrange yourself under in an orderly fashion. Don't you love it? That means I get to consider myself less than somebody else. I put myself under the domain of somebody else. I write to myself under. So don't you just love it? I had a guy pass me this morning. Now, y'all, this was a long time ago this morning. I'm talking about what's going on right <coughs> now. Police cars everywhere. Flies. Shoo! And some little white car. I won't tell you where it's from, but it was north of the Mason-Dixon. <laughs> that give me any clues? I'm thinking to myself, why? Wonder how many of our tax dollars get spent on speed limit signs. Why bother? We could take that, those tax dollars back and send it over here to the, uh, the alternative high school or something. Right? Submit. You see the same word translated subject. Same word. Point B. Peter is saying, Pastor, this is God's will. Uh, I grew up in a time where if you went and applied for a job, asked for a job, and, and uh, whoever you talked to usually ended up being your boss. And in those days, you had to obey your boss. Anybody? Mm -hmm. One of the first jobs I ever applied for, the old boy said, yeah, yeah, I think I'd give you a job where you cut your hair. I ain't telling you more of the details. Where you cut your hair. I thought, well, I can look like a hoodlum for the rest of my life, or I can make some money. And Friday night, I can go out. Hoss, I'm cutting any oil cut. Anybody remember them days? And you had to please your boss? Can, can you remember? <laughs> there was an ad in the paper the other day. I ain't going to tell you what it says because somebody will think. You're cruel, you're mean, you are offensive. You need to read the paper. What was the Friday's paper? One ad. It's completely told what he did not want to show up on his construction job. You ever been on a construction job lately? You could just about imagine what he said. Don't bother showing up if you look like this. Lily said, I already called him, just congratulate him. <laughs> but, can you remember what it was like to have to do what you were told? He said, well, I ain't going to do nothing. I don't want to. No, fine, but then you don't get paid. 
Amen. Mm -hmm. Anybody here know about a brick hod? Brick hod. I'm talking about hard bricks. A brick hod. <laughs> it's this triangle apparatus on a pole. You can use it for one of two things. Toting cinder blocks or bricks or as a torture device. <laughs> one, of bless one old boy showed up with shoulder pads. Football shoulder pads at work one day because that thing hurt y'all. You get it full of them. Here you are. <laughs> I'm doing this for what? Because it's a blessing to do what you're told? No, I want to get paid. That's the only reason. Now, I don't know how in the world a lot of things operate this day and time, but in them days, if you didn't rank yourself under somebody, it didn't pay. And Peter said, you'll forgive me, Peter's not a knothead like I am, but it's as if Peter said, listen, this is God's will. Now you ain't got to do it if you don't want to, but if you want to please your boss, man, submit. Likewise. And then we're told basically of four groups, and I'm going to quit, don't worry. Pastors submit to God, one. Number two, younger submit to the elder. Three, Christians submit to one another. And four, those going through suffering, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. Well, somebody said, how do we get from suffering to submission? And some of you probably understand they're intricately tied together there. Mm -hmm. Good night. But God's using his tool, amen, as the thing he affects change in our life. You're here today, you've never been born again. If you have to say, I'm not sure whether I have or not, then you haven't been. 30 minutes from now, you'll be able to say, I'm sure that I've had lunch. I feel it. If you're here today and you don't know that you've been born again, Jesus says you must be born again. To see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It can happen right here and right now if you just be willing to let God use His tool in your life and bring you to your knees figuratively before the Lord of Lords. If you're here today and you're a believer and you maybe you struggle with uh, submission issues, this world is taking its toll on us, y'all. I think God can fix that thing. That's what His Word's for. It's His tool. You're here today and you're going through trying times and it's wearing you down. God's given us a way to walk through that thing, too. With His tool. The Word of God. We pray with me? It's a blessing, y'all, to know that there's a God who loves us, who sent His Son to die for us, who's written us a word to tell us about these things and also to prepare us for the fact that His Son's coming back again. If God's spoken a word to you today, It'd be his doing, not mine, I promise you. Let him have his way. Just let him have his way. Father, in Jesus' name, you know us perfectly. We're naked and open before whom we have to do. If you've spoken to us today, it's not been a wrong number. It's a direct statement to an individual heart. Would you please help us today, Lord? to respond as we pray in Jesus' name. Let's continue praying. Our group's going to sing. If there's something you need to get square, come as the group sings.